you be in his heart today that you place the message on him so that he can, he's able to deliver it to us. That is the message that we are ready to receive today, Lord. I want to pray for the band as they help us glorify you. And I just want to pray for anyone today that is struggling with any health issues, anything that's going on in their life, Lord, that you place your healing hands on them. I pray all these things in your glorious name, Lord God. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again, church. I'm happy to be with you guys. It's good to be together. We're going to sing and, and celebrate what the Lord has done this morning. So why don't you stand your feet as we worship a little. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life Cause Christ rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by jesus christ the righteous i'm justified this is my testimony oh i'm alive this is my testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I Thank you for the truth that we get to sing about, Lord, that you're always with us. Lord, when our life seems hard and like there's no path forward, God, you do make a way for us when we trust you. Um, Lord, your word says that you care for us, um, that you make our path straight. Uh, you're a lamp to our feet. And so just help to trust you. Uh, speak to us through your word uh, today, Lord. And uh, Lord, just glorify yourself and reveal, reveal yourself to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. And um, just to do a quick intro, so um, if Josir mentioned it, then I'll repeat it again if you just got in. Our uh, pastor Bobby and his wife Jody had a beautiful baby girl on Friday, so we'll pray for them. And uh, just that she continues to be healthy. Pastor James is in North Carolina with his family. And so we have Mike Campo, who's been in the ministry, who's been a part of Meeting House Church and then Central Baptist before that, uh, to bring the word to us this morning. So thanks, Mike. This thing on? Okay, good. So um, this morning, as I was, I was thinking through this week, James texted me on Sunday, and he's like, are you available to preach next Sunday? And I said, sure. And you would have thought from that point on that, you know, everything was going to go perfect this week, so God can prepare me to come up here and preach to you in a good mood and have it all together and focused. Uh, that wasn't how it worked out. So there's three aspects this morning we're going to talk about of God's grace. That is God's grace in temptation, God's grace in salvation, and God's grace in suffering. Now, what is God's grace? God's grace is God's unmerited favor. Those are the words for God's grace, but it's also deeper than that. It's, it's a feeling, it's a strength, it's a power, and sometimes the only way we can know it is through that experience, and once we've experienced God's grace, that's how you know the true meaning of God's grace. So I'm going to use some illustrations. So the first, the first point of this is God's grace and temptation. I failed this week miserably. I did everything the opposite of what I was supposed to do in a given situation when Satan was testing me. So I, I'm a project manager uh, where I work, and these projects have millions of dollars resting on them. If these deadlines aren't met, the company can lose millions of dollars. And in this climate, that's a terrible thing because the company can go under and all kinds of things can happen. Plus, we work with hospitals, so that's our client. So every action that we have on our project affects that hospital. If hospital IT people need to uh, be attending COVID patients and they're on the phone with me because of all this money involved, that screws everything up and hospitals are short staffed right now. So like I said, James texted me Sundays, oh, are you be able to preach? And I'm like, yeah, and I'm all excited. So we're going to work Monday morning and everything I'd worked on the week before had imploded. All the deadlines imploded. And so I automatically got angry and I started blaming other people. It's their fault, it's their fault. And so we had a phone call, and I said, 
you know, I went into the phone call angry. And that was kind of how the sin started, anger. Now, sometimes what I'll do, as soon as I get angry, I go to the Lord. And I say, Lord, please give me the grace to do this. I give you my anger. Please let me control my tongue. Don't let me say anything mean. Don't let me try to be vengeful, because that's my nature. If somebody strikes me, I'm going to strike back. That's just how I am. I'm sure maybe some other people struggle with that nature as well. So Monday, the anger started. And one thing I kind of have an agreement with, I have Carl Schofield in the audience. Whenever we're going through a difficult spiritual battle, we call or text each other to kind of keep each other in check and pray for one another. So I had a bad day Monday, and I kind of felt the Lord saying, call Carl, talk to Carl. And I said, no, Lord, I'm going to handle this on my own. Don't worry about it. Stupidly, that was my pride. And so Tuesday, it gets even worse. This deadline isn't meant so It's time to throw somebody under the bus. Well, so I was the guy to get thrown under the bus, along with other people. Well, luckily, I always keep documentation of how everything goes. So then Tuesday, my anger is building again, and I'm saying, who am I going to unload on by the end of the week? Because I'm not going to let this anger go unaddressed. I know this is not the Christian way to handle it. The Christian way would be, as I've sometimes done in the past, and I try to do, Lord, you know, help me to have self-control, help me to get through this spiritual battle. And all the time, Satan is pressing my buttons. That's exactly what it was. Every day, pressing my buttons. So it wasn't just a typical battle. It was the the attack of Satan. Let's press this button. Let's press that button. So by the time Thursday rolls around, actually Wednesday rolls around, I'm already cranked up because of all the stuff going on at work. And then my roof starts leaking on top of that. And so I'm like... And then Heather's like, oh, there's a snowstorm Friday. We've got to get it fixed. And I'm thinking, two days to get it fixed. That's not going to be good. So, of course, it's still leaking, right? So this was right before a community group we had on Wednesday. So a community group, did I say I was struggling with anger? No. Satan had me cranked up. He's like, get in the ring with me, Mike. Come on. And I'm dumb enough to do it out of my pride. So... Long story short, week goes on, Friday we have a meeting, and there's this one supervisor, I even think he's a Christian, you know, he's graceful, he manages people well. We had a meeting with him, and he said, oh, somebody's quitting, somebody working on this project, and so he says, we're going to have to take on more work. That was it, baby. Satan pressed that final button. As soon as we're out of that meeting, I'm like, somebody's got to pay for this. I know that sounds terrible. And again, I didn't text or call one of my spiritual mentors, Carl. I should say my spiritual mentor. But and again, I didn't. I didn't even when I approached the Lord in the morning during my quote quiet time. Did I give the Lord my anger? No. I'm like, oh, let's read through Psalm 119, Lord. But all the time, the Lord is saying, Mike, quiet down. Get into prayer. Don't react in anger. It says, sleep on your anger. Meditate. Give it to the Lord. Recognize it's a spiritual battle. Nope. Saturday rolls around, no, Friday rolls around, and it was Friday at 4.30, and I said, it's time for the supervisor to pay the piper. I I know this sounds horrible. I'm just explaining the sinful battle in my week, right? It was horrible. Satan was getting the best of me because I engaged in battle without the spiritual armor of the Lord, something I had fallen for for years and something I felt that God had given me victory in because I used to be such an angry person, and I would explode, and I hadn't had this struggle like this in so long. And Satan knew that. I got comfortable kind of being like, ha-ha, I've overcome that sin. So I figured Friday at 4.30, I'm going to G-chat the supervisor. And I'll keep him professional, but I'll do just enough to make him feel terrible about himself. So when he goes into his weekend, it's ruined. And again, I know this is evil. I'm just saying this was my struggle this week where I gave into temptation. So sure enough, I did that. And then he says, oh, I'm not feeling good. I don't know if I have COVID. And I'm like, that was a terrible time to target this guy, wasn't it? I didn't do anything out of the rules, but just passively, aggressively enough to try to hurt him and take up my anger on someone. But when he said he was sick, I'm like, oh, I can't go through with this. So I stuffed it until Saturday, and poor Heather and Jeremy, they got the brunt of my anger. Terrible thing. I'm just confessing my sin to all of you. So Saturday morning, I don't know, something fell on my foot, something in the kitchen that was like half frozen, and I, and I just killed me, it just fell on my foot, and that was the last straw. Heather, you didn't clean the house! Like, I don't live in the house! Like, I can't help with the housework! 
What's going on here, Heather? You're scrapbooking craps all over the table. Okay? So, and I'm preaching today, and here I am going bananas at home on a Saturday morning, ruining her day after a tough week. The roof is leaking. All this stuff. But I saved it up until Saturday, and the Lord was telling me all week through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, don't do it, Mike. Calm down. Carl, Carl, reach out to Joe. Pray. You know, just lay down. Because a lot of times, if, if I know I'm going kind of on the edge, I'll lay down for like a half an hour, and I'll just pray. Nope wasn't happening. You know why? Satan was pressing those buttons. And I fell for his trick like I could fight that battle on my own. The Bible says that spiritual battle we can't win on our own. Put on the full armor of God. Nope. Then finally, Heather left after I blew up. Don't worry, I didn't hurt her physically and I didn't go too crazy. I didn't punch walls. Although I have punched walls in the past, which I know is horrible. I know, but I never hurt anyone physically. So, anyhow, the Lord said, okay, let's remap this, Mike. You started off here. James texted you. You were so excited. You were going to preach. You were going to help out. And then the whole thing went downhill. If you would have just came to me on Monday, I would have given you the strength to deal with this. Wisdom kind of should have told you that Satan's going to be working overtime. Right? Right? And how does he do it? Presses our button. There's different buttons for everybody. But that was kind of my week. And so, you know, it just, it, yesterday, it just kind of came to a head. But then through God's grace, he showed me this. And he wasn't like, Mike, you idiot. You fell again. What a loser. You're not worthy to preach all this garbage. Because Satan brings us up just to knock us down. Isn't that the ultimate plan? When he's all psyched up, yeah, get angry, take it out, it'll feel good. Then as soon as we do it, how could you do that? You're not a Christian. What a terrible person. So anyhow, the Lord kind of took me through all that, and, and I realized the ripple effect of my sin, how it affected Heather's day, how it affected Jeremy's day, how it affected my daughter's day. But fortunately, in God's grace, God fixed it. When Heather got home, we were able to talk about it. My anger was calmed down, and we got through it, and here I am, a little more calm. But I could have taken advantage of that right away and avoided those problems. So I'm going to give you a biblical example of the same scenario, illustrating the same sin, pride and anger, just to show human nature really hasn't changed that much. We're going to talk about Peter's reaction to the arrest of Jesus. And this goes back to the garden when Judas, who was an apostle, who was an apostle turned on Jesus and betrayed him. This is my paraphrase of those verses. While Jesus was speaking, a large crowd approached, led by Judas the apostle. Judas went straight to Jesus and greeted him with a kiss. Jesus looked at Judas in the eye and said, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers realized that he was going to be arrested, they said, Lord, should we strike them down with our swords? But before Jesus could answer, Peter had already sliced off the ear of the high priest's servant. When Jesus saw what Peter had done, he said, enough of this. And then he touched the servant's ear and healed him. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Don't you know that I could pray to the Father and he would immediately send 12 legions of angels to protect me? But how else would the scriptures be fulfilled? This must be so. So if you think about it, Peter had been walking with Jesus. He'd been walking with God. We don't have that advantage per se. We're not physically with the Lord. And yet his anger arose first thing. And I'm not criticizing him because I've seen that. But you have to think if he was in tune with God's grace before that moment, would he have struck? Because if you notice everyone else, they asked Jesus first if they should strike. Peter never asked. He just went full force. And I don't think he was aiming for his ear. Probably aiming for his head. Okay? So in Peter's, in Peter's mind, I'm sure he thought that was the right thing to do. Here comes the scumbag Jesus. He just betrayed him. Here come the soldiers. Here come the high priest. These are the bad guys. And I'm the good guy. I'm on the Lord's side. Natural instinct. Take the sword. But if he had been more in tune with God's grace... Would he have reacted that way? I mean, if you think about it, that's sort of the same way I was reacting throughout the week. My anger and in my pride, 
I was fighting. And even in this time, Peter knew ultimately God's plan because Christ had already revealed what God's plan was. And again, we can all react in this way given the circumstance, but Peter was like me this week. Peter was on the autopilot, I think, to an extent. There was a part of him that had not been tamed yet. And maybe it could have been tamed prior to this if he was praying and if he was in God's grace and if he did realize God's plan. But it was that emotional reaction. And when we have that emotional reaction to sin, just as I did, God's grace is there for strength and for the spiritual battle, but I'm not using it. God's grace is always there, but I'm not always using it. Sometimes I don't even want to. I want to do things on my own because that's sin. So God's grace is always there. In my case and in Peter's case, we both weren't in tune with it. And this can happen to us every day, right? Unforeseen circumstances happen all the time. Did we know COVID was going to happen? Could anybody have foreseen that? I didn't. I almost died of it, and that's my next part of this. So God's grace in suffering. Raise your hand if you like to suffer. Nobody does, right? That's not fun. I hate it. So I went uh, through a season of suffering in my life, and... What God did was he forced me to face some of my greatest fears. And so in 2018, I woke up one morning with a toothache. That doesn't sound big. How many of you had a tooth infection before? Isn't it just the most miserable ache? It may not always be intense, but it's always there. So I go to the dentist. I get on antibiotics. He fixes it. And then I start getting earaches and ringing in my ear. And I started getting these ear infections. So for two years, from 2018 to 2021, that's three years, there probably wasn't a day that went by where I didn't have a tooth infection or an ear infection or a urinary tract infection. Just all that within that amount of time. And what God did first and foremost, I always prided myself on performance. My Christianity was performance. I'm performing for God. It worked. All I wanted to do was perform and get the best reviews That was what I was valuing. And when I was sick all the time and missing work, and my performance wasn't 100%, because I was always in pain and on these medications, my performance, that, that whole system of mine imploded, and my ego imploded. And I had to learn it's not about my performance, it's about God's grace. God, how am I going to accomplish everything I, need to, everything I need to do today if I feel like physical garbage? If I didn't sleep the night before, which I didn't get a lot of sleep during that time because I was always in pain, how do I face the challenge of the day? My bosses are going to criticize me. I'm going to get demoted. People are going to think I'm weak. These are all the things that went through my mind. These were my worst fears, that people would think I'm weak or I'm not, you know, I'm not a hard worker or I'm not perfect or all those things going through my mind. God's grace got me through those fears. Because if I didn't have God's grace, if I wasn't a Christian, I probably would have gone insane. Think about it. Three years of a toothache, an earache, and everything that goes along with that. Antibiotics, which further destroys your immune system. And all that, God's presence was there. And it was a daily thing. I started doing my quiet time in the morning with a little more urgency. It wasn't just, oh, Lord, please give me a good day today and and bless me. That's kind of what a a routine that it was. Then God helped me get through the day. I'm in so much physical pain. And that went on and on and on for that amount of time. And just when I thought it was over, another tooth would start hurting. This was like beyond science. The dentist didn't know what to do. So after losing six teeth, and I take care of my teeth, believe it or not, after losing six teeth over the course from 2018 to 21, That I went through a lot of, it was all that pain and earaches and all this other stuff. So I finally in 2021 in March, I said, I got the last tooth out. I had a tooth infection. I said, it's finally over. And God taught me so much, you know. And I, I did, I had a lot more. And I, I'm not going to dare call myself humble, but God humbled me when I couldn't perform. But God's grace was there even when I couldn't do my best. That's when I experienced it. It's even hard to put into words But I'm sure some of you know what I mean. Sleepless nights, physical pain, illness, 
God's grace is there. It is unmerited favor, but it was there, and I felt it. But here's the unfortunate thing. It didn't end there for me. Oh, no. So then, right after that toothache, right after that last tooth infection, wake up one morning, about a week after that, st- I was still hurting from the dental surgery. My chest was tight. And I was one of these guys who was a little bit political about COVID. I'm not going to get into politics, but I'm not going to wear a mask. That's what the government wants me to do. Vaccine. It only took them a week to develop it. And I'm not getting political. I'm just saying I started getting kind of a nasty attitude of him versus them, you know. I turned it political until I got COVID and almost died. Then it wasn't so good. So when I wake up, my tooth is still aching from the surgery. My chest is really tight. And I'm like, Heather, something's wrong. I don't feel right. And she's like, oh, no, this is your imagination. Because <laughs> she's probably figuring, hey, you can't get sick again. Days goes on, I get a fever. My chest is tighter. Finally, I couldn't get out of bed. Had to call the, had to call the uh, ambulance. So I'm figuring, I'm going to the ambulance. Well, they'll just, you know, they'll just give me fluids, right? That's always the thing you think. I won't be in there longer than a day. So I go into the emergency room. They're like, oh, you have COVID pneumonia. We're going to have to admit you. And I'm thinking, ha ha, well, it's just going to be a night, right? So I go to the, I go to the uh, hospital room. And these counselors come in, and they start talking to me. And they didn't seem too optimistic. They sat down with this clipboard, and they said, well, we're going to try this five-day exper- experimental treatment in two days of this, and blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking to myself, I'm not going to be here for five days. I was ready to be like, forget about five days in the hospital. I'll take one day, because it was a morbid place. I mean, they did a great job, but if you've been in those COVID wards, I mean, you're in this room and you're alone, you can't have any visitors, it's miserable. So the, all this time this is happening, I'm feeling like garbage, and by this time I'm doped up on all kinds of medication. And so when this counselor sat down with me, she didn't sound very optimistic. And so she left the room, and she explained the treatment, and I'm thinking, this doesn't seem right. This can't be happening. So sure enough, they start doing the treatments. And I'm in bed, and it just got worse, and I wasn't responding. And so at least at this point, I had the room to myself. And I can't say I felt God's grace in this moment. There was no emotion. There was no, ha ha, God's grace moment. I didn't necessarily feel it right then. I was, here comes that anger again. God, I just got over all this other garbage. Why are you throwing COVID on me? That's exactly how I felt. So then they move a guy into my room. And this guy's in worse shape than I am. He's like 40 pounds heavier, and he's like 20 pounds older. And he was not doing good. So we're in the room together and didn't get any sleep because he's coughing all night. But as we're in the room, I start hearing him moaning. And I start feeling the room getting hot. And it was hotter, it was harder to breathe. And we're both like, what's going on here? And so you can press the emergency button, but they're not coming right away. They got to put on all that hazardous gear and all that other stuff. So we're both having a hard time breathing. And I'm probably like at 106 right now on the fever. I was 104 before the industrial air filter started malfunctioning in our room, which that's what caused it to get hot. Nurse comes in, and we tell her, you know, we told her how hot it, we were, and we, we had a hard time breathing. She's like, oh, nothing wrong here, nothing to see here. But then this industrial air filter in the hospital, which is meant to exhaust all the bad COVID-infected air out a certain way and to make sure it doesn't go into the hallway, that thing started cranking out this noise and heating up. And then, you know, at that point, we're like, we just got to do something about this. And I was doing it more for him, but I, at this point, I'm like, I got to do something. So there's a window next to me. I, I was so doped up that I forgot there was all these wires on me and needles so I said, I got to open that window. I hadn't been out of bed for like three days. And my condition wasn't improving. My blood oxygen was low, had a high fever. And so I get out of bed wrapped up in all these wires. And this was all instinct. I tried to open the window and it wouldn't open. So I jacked it up. And, and I was so weak, I fell back to my bed. And I'm all wrapped up in wires and I had these IVs. And so then I got up again. I actually... <laughs> broke the window. <laughs> the, the runner, not the glass, the runner that the window was on. See, the thing is, though, the infectious disease control manager goes to this church, Linda. And she's responsible for the air in that room. I didn't put two and two together at the time. I never confessed this, Linda. 
I blame the nurse. No. <laughs> so I lifted up the window because it was so hot. And then all the nurses come in, and they're kind of like freaking out. <laughs> and Linda comes in, and she's like, who broke the, who opened the window? You can't do that. Now all he is contaminated. <laughs> and she's questioning the nurses. And I almost felt like speaking up, right? <laughs> and I should have, but I didn't. <laughs> this poor nurse. It wasn't me. She's like, and she looks at the other nurse. It wasn't me. <laughs> and I didn't have the heart to tell Linda it was me. I needed, I, this is just going crazy. So then Linda looked at the machine and she says, why is this duct tape to the window? That's part of the problem. You're not supposed to use duct tape on an industrial air purifier. They just had a tube duct tape going outside. So anyhow, but when the nurses came in, they were going to put me in the ICU at that point. Because after I had ripped up the window, that took all my strength. My fever's going higher and higher and higher. My blood oxygen's way down here. And I'm all wrapped up in my wires. So the Lord intervened, and Linda said, let's put Mike in a private room. And they got us out of there because I guess the room was considered contaminated. But this is where God's grace came in. Because I was in such bad shape. The goal every day was just to get to a chair that was five feet away, and that was a huge chore. So on the fourth morning, they finally said, you got to get out of bed, and and your exercise for today is to get to to that chair. So I go to that chair, and there was a sermon on TV. And the sermon was on uh, Shadrach, Meshad, and Abednego. And basically, they were three Jewish men who were taken captive from their homeland. And they were brought into a religious political system that was contrary to everything they had been brought up with. Can you imagine that? Your whole heritage, your religion, your family separated from all that. And they got castrated on top of it. And so the king gave them a a whole new duty. Sorry about that castration. I can see it. No. But I'm just saying, can you imagine what they went through for suffering? It's like us being taken out of Middleborough and taken into Russia. A whole, a whole different system. And there would be no America to rescue you. Think about that. That's what was happening to them. Can you imagine the suffering? Can you imagine what Satan would say to them in the night while they're sleeping? How could God let this happen? From what you learned growing up, God is a God of love. He was supposed to protect you. You were behaving all this time. You were, com- you were committed to God all this time. Why are you under King Nebuchadnezzar's system now? Why were you taken captive? You were being faithful to the Lord. Is those... Those believers, or so-called believers, the hypocrites, they weren't being faithful. And Shadrach, Meshad, and Abednego were faithful. But they were taken away anyway. Because that can happen no matter how much we are faithful. It it doesn't mean we're going to be sheltered from these terrible things. So can you imagine the suffering that they were going through in their life? But they remained faithful because they prayed to God every day. But then one day the king said... You're going to worship me. Now, here's the ultimate test. Because they were able to pray every day still within that system. And I'm sure they were trying to remain hopeful, and they were trying to walk with the Lord. But then the king said, time to bow down, baby. That's the rule. If you don't bow down to me, you're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. If their suffering wasn't bad enough already, how's that threat? I don't know how I'd feel about that. Mike, you're going to get thrown in the fiery, sir, uh, the fiery furnace if, if you're faithful to the Lord and you pray. I don't know if I'd be able to resist not giving in because I know my own nature. Hopefully God would give me the grace in the moment. So anyhow, the reason why I'm saying in this because this was my battle that night in the hospital. God gave me through his grace this story. So... When the king threatened them and said, if you don't bow down to the statue, you're going to be thrown in the furnace. Do you remember what they said? God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we still have God, we still have faith in the Lord and God's grace. Even if he doesn't deliver us. And I'm sure they're as human as us in their mind. They had to be, they had to be Satan in the back of their mind saying, just let it go. God will forgive you. Just bow down for a second. What's the big deal? Move on. Life's going to be easier if you just bow down and shut this king up. You can still be in your heart committed to to God, but just bow down. They said, even if God doesn't deliver, 
So they ended up going into the furnace, and God did deliver. But that night, I experienced even a more fun part of COVID is the stomach trauma. <laughs> Not to get graphic, but for about four days, I lived in the bathroom. So anyhow, I get a stomach illness. I'm in the bathroom that night, and I'm just completely sick, completely weak. And then I'm looking down, and my nose starts bleeding from that oxygen. And I'm at the lowest point, and that's when the devil... And I, I was experiencing God's grace to get through this. I probably should have reiterated. My worst fear in life was to die alone in a hospital. Because my mother was a nurse, and she always told these horrible stories of what it was like when patients died alone in the hospital without their families. And somehow... There was a chance I could die because of the simple math. High fever, low blood oxygen. I was teetering on that. And I did feel God's grace in that in the sense he kept my sanity through that time. When I was facing my worst fear, I was alone and I could die alone. So that night, the devil came in my ear. As I'm in the bathroom, my nose is bleeding. He says, where's God now? Where's God now? You were at your lowest point. You just went from 2018 to now. You started to get hope after your tooth and your ears and urinary tract infections, and God put you here? Why would God do that? Why? So I could face my worst fears and know his grace. I didn't go insane in that moment. I had my sanity. And I felt God's strength and presence. And it came into my mind, and I said it out loud. Even if God doesn't deliver me, God is still God. His grace was just as powerful before I went in there as when I was in that bathroom with my nose bleeding and experiencing all kinds of other horrific things. That's where I felt God's grace. It was beyond just unmerited favor. It was real. It was there. It was powerful. Not that I say I want to go through that again, because I don't. But he brought me to face that worst fear. And it wasn't, in God's grace, it, it wasn't consuming me. It didn't destroy me. I could live with it. It wasn't a good feeling, but I knew that if I did die, I'm going to go into God's presence. I'm not going to Satan's fiery furnace in hell. And I could hear Satan taunting me, not audibly, but I said, you know what, Satan? Even if I die, God is still God, and it's still part of his plan. So that's God's grace in suffering. And I guess the practical application is no, you can know God's grace in that circumstance. If you get COVID, whatever comes into your life, God's grace will be there. You're going to go through the fearful moments, but know there is nothing for a Christian that is beyond God's grace, where you know his presence, his peace. That's the only way I can explain it. There's no other explanation for this being my worst place of fear in life and me having peace. Because within our humanity, I get anxious just coming here this morning to speak. Oh, am I going to do a perfect job? Oh, am I going to have my notes? God's getting me through this. That's God's grace. And sometimes those moments are going to come. You may not be on your deathbed in the hospital with COVID, but those moments are going to come in life. And fortunately, through God's grace, I heard that sermon that morning on television. And believe me, I had like three channels. I had a Finger Hut 24-7 infomercial. I had the Hallmark Channel, and I had whatever channel was showing this sermon. And if I, by God's grace, if I hadn't changed the channel from Finger Hut trying to figure out what the heck Finger Hut is... Some sort of credit Amway system. You know? That sermon was God's grace. And the last thing is God's grace in salvation. God's grace in salvation. So I can give you an illustration from my own life. Um, before I came to know the Lord, you guys probably know some of my testimony. Uh, I was demon-possessed, believe it or not. I really was. You want to talk to me in private about it, I'll tell you about that wonderful experience. Point being, you're a little bit far from the Lord when you have such a demonic influence in your life. And it doesn't have to be demonic per se. We all come from different places. You could have had any torment in your life, right? We all have torments in our life. 
could be anything. But before we come to know the Lord, we're dealing with that on our own. And we're far from the Lord. And so I remember going through high school, there was a substitute teacher who was a minister. I was brought up Catholic. I was taught taught that Protestants were like second-class Christians, although they weren't Christians, you know? Oh, they're not baptized as babies. They're going to hell. I mean, I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just saying that's what I was taught. But I remember there was a minister at that high school who was a substitute teacher, and there were kids who would talk about going to his youth group and how awesome that church was. And I'm thinking, wow, that sounds like an exciting place. So me being the person that I am, I just would always make fun of this guy because that's ter- I know it's a terrible thing, but for some reason I think I would just always target this poor guy and make fun of him. I was not nice to this man. So as I got more and more involved in demonic things, as I got older, into my later teens, I just became more and more crazy, did, broke the law more and more and more, just on a massive downward spiral. And then the Lord started working in my life. And uh, I had an exorcism. But I didn't get saved after the exorcism. The person who did it explained that what he said is, if you go sin again, this demon's going to come back in your life worse than it was. He didn't leave me with optimism. I don't know what denomination he came from. He, did, he cast the demon out in the name of Jesus, but he didn't share the gospel. So he left me with, if I, don't, if I sin again, this demon's coming back in my life. And unfortunately, I knew myself at that point that I would sin again. But that's when God's grace came in. Because that's when I started praying, but someone gave me a Bible. Well, it hadn't been my brother, but we had a Bible hanging around the house. And of course, once you've been demon-possessed, or you had a demonic influence, or whatever struggle it was that was destroying you, you do get to the breaking point. And so I started reading my Bible. And I can't say I felt God's presence at that point or what have you, but... I started getting my life together. Now, I had dropped out of high school, and I decided, okay, I got my GD, and I was going to go to college. Now, I had to get my transcripts from my high school to go to college, and I was supposed to go there at 2 p.m. So I woke up one morning, and I hear, you guys are going to think I'm schizo. I didn't hear an audible audible voice, but something said to me, go to the school at 10 a.m., which was totally contrary to my nature to wake up that early. 10 a.m., you know, I'm like 19 years old. Even my mother's like, why are you going to the school at 10 a.m.? You hate school and you hate mornings. I'm like, I don't know. I get there, and who's at the door? That minister is right at the door when I walk in. That's God's grace. That is God's grace. So I go up to him, and I kind of tested him a little bit because I still didn't know what a minister was. He was a Protestant. He was a second-class Christian. I was taught, if even a Christian. I said, um, I said, you know, I, I got to tell you about this weird experience I had. I said, I was demon-possessed. I got an exorcism. I'm reading the Bible, and I'm trying to, to figure out what's going on spiritually because I know that darkness exists, but I don't know God existed in all that because it didn't feel like it. And he shared the gospel with me. And we did it. He did it in a non-judgmental way, in a simple way that I can understand. There wasn't 100 steps to get saved like I expected. He says, if you accept the Lord and you become born again, he will work in your life. You'll go to heaven. And he gave me like a gospel of John. And I knew that moment was a divine appointment. Have you ever had the feeling you just know where you're supposed to be at that time? Like it was a predestined situation. You, you can't even put it together in your mind, but you know you're supposed to be in that moment at that time. And I knew that. That was God's grace. I just knew that moment was meant to be. It was amazing. So I go away from that, and, you know, he invited me to go to a youth group, right? And so, and he says, oh, come to my office, too. We, we can talk. So I go to his office, and what I, what I noticed about this man is he didn't judge me. I mean, I always made fun of him. I always misbehave. He didn't hold that against me, which I thought was strange, right? 
So then I go to his office, and he shared the Lord with me, right? And he says, you want to say the sinner's prayer? And he showed me a book. And the book had like 100 people that were praying for me from the moment he talked to me at the school. He had the church praying for me for this moment to happen, and it did. And I'm like, why would these people pray for me? They don't even know me. Why would he pray for me? He's going to waste his time with me. So we pray the sinner's prayer. And my life completely changed because of God's grace. I didn't have God's grace before that. God was there, but I didn't have it. I, didn't, had, I had not turned to the Lord, and my life completely changed, which I know probably sounds crazy, but that is only God's grace. That power beyond our willpower, that power that is there, was the only power that could turn me around and turn my life around. And from there on, I started helping him with youth group. I got involved in the ministry. I married his daughter, which I'm sure he didn't like that. No, he did like that. But the question is, there may be some people that, when it comes to this salvation portion, have not experienced it yet, who don't know what it is. You've heard of it, but what is it? It sounds great, but I don't feel it. And you may not feel it in your emotions, Heather's pancakes must have had extra salt this morning. <laughs> you may not feel it, I suppose, like I did at the time. But if you don't know God's grace and salvation, don't wait to feel it. Sometimes you've got to go through the door to see what's inside the room. So if, if you are not saved this morning by God's grace, you can have it now. You don't have to wait. God says today is the day of salvation. He didn't say tomorrow. He didn't, say that he, he didn't say an hour from now. He, today is the day of salvation. And you can have that. You don't have to live in torment without the Lord. Because that's what it is. It's pure torment. When I look back. And so if you don't know the Lord, the only, what you just have to do is pray, Lord, show me the truth. Sometimes it's just a general prayer. Show me the truth. Show me your grace. You get this nut job at the pulpit talking about grace, but there's something that is clicking about the whole thing. Start it today. Lord, show me the truth. Because this sin problem that I've described in depth in me, when we become Christians, it's still a struggle. The, the Bible says, even within our Christian walk, the good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I don't want to do is what I do. doesn't mean we do that 24-7. But you ever had that experience? I know people who go to the doctor, like my grandfather. The doctor says, you're going to die if you keep eating all those sweets. No, no, I'm not going to die of type 2 diabetes. So we continued eating terribly, and of course he died. The doctor knew more than him, right? The doctor knew more, but the human nature, oh, I don't, that doctor's full of, he doesn't know what he's talking about, blah, blah, I can go on eating sweets. And he died of type 2 diabetes. Point being that God knows better than we do about this whole eternal plan. And it's hard to imagine. But today is the day of salvation. You can pray it right now. You don't need me or a priest to do it with you, although we don't mind doing it with you. But today is the day. Today is your day. Pray to the Lord. Because we owe a debt for our sin, the Bible teaches. There is a justice system. We see a justice system on this earth, which is very flawed, as you can see in our country, right? Getting more flawed by the day in many ways. But God's justice system demands a payment for our sin, which we can't afford. All this anger that I have and, and all the sin I committed, it's all residual, right? I mean, I may have said something to hurt somebody, and, they, and that hurt impacted their life in such a way where they hurt somebody else, and then that person hurt somebody else even worse. That's why the sin problem is so great, because I think the residual effects of it. I always thought I'm a good person, but maybe what I said to that person, that they broke them. Or what I did, who knows? But the thing is, because of our sin and in God's justice, God's justice system, we owe a debt. And we can't pay that debt. God says right off the bat in the Bible, the, the Bible is really just to explain the state we're in. We owe a debt, and that debt is punishment. All of us, it says. And unfortunately, that punishment is hell. That's how it describes it. It's a place of eternal torment. 
So the way I look at that is, you know, probably the worst physical pain I've ever felt. Multiply that times a thousand. You ever get burned slightly? You know, whatever, you know, fire or touch the hot stove. Can you imagine that for eternity but intensified beyond what you can imagine? I get a feeling that's what hell is going to be like. I didn't declare that that was the punishment, but God does. And it says that we have that on our shoulders. We, he says every man, every person has that sense. They have that guilt. They are aware of God and they are without excuse. You don't have to have that today. You can give that to the Lord today because Christ paid that debt. Because we couldn't. God came to earth in the form of a man. He paid that for us, what we couldn't pay. So we don't have to suffer the penalty which he has already told us, which is eternal separation in hell. But it is our choice. We can gamble and say, you know, I don't think I trust that Bible. It's just religion. I mean, you got the Koran, you got Hinduism, there's all these wonderful selections. Well, God says those selections aren't an option. They're tempting because it makes me feel good if I can keep all these rules, and there's nothing wrong with keeping rules, obviously. But God says though, those are not the eternal solution. The, the solution is Jesus, because he paid the debt. He went to the cross. He was nailed to a cross physically. Can you imagine what that would be like? You have your disciples who believed in you. Many of them thought that Jesus was going to deliver them from the government. And then they see him nailed to a cross, and they're like, this guy betrayed us. Is there anything that went through their minds? This guy failed his mission. He said he was God, and he's getting nailed to a cross. He's wearing a crown of thorns. He's up there, no clothes on, humiliated. Do you think Satan said to each disciple, if he was God, he would get himself down? That's what I would have been saying. As soon as I saw him on the cross, I'm like, see you later, another liar, another salesman. As terrible as that sounds, I'm sure that's what went through their minds, at least some of them. So he paid the debt for our sin by dying on the cross. He took that punishment of us having to experience that, or the pain and the torment of being nailed to a cross, but for eternity. But then what happens three days later? He comes back, he's resurrected. And he used that as an illustration. Everything I told you is true. Here's the proof of it. Now go forward and share that message. And so God's grace in this point, and I'm wrapping it up, is that if you have not received it, pray to the Lord now, act now and just when we go into prayer in a second, and say, Lord, show me the truth. Show me the way. I, want, I know I'm a sinner. Please make your grace known to me can start right there and he will I promise you and for Christians like myself I need to be challenged to share that God share God's grace with other people what if that minister decided I'm not going to talk to that punk here's the guy who made fun of me when I was a substitute teacher but he didn't say that because he knew God's grace and God's grace and God's Holy Spirit was leading him and he cooperated with it because we have the choice every day to cooperate as Christians right like me, I, I decide not to cooperate with God this week, and it led to bad things. Excuse me. So I guess my challenge to the believers, and this is to myself, is in these difficult times, this, this is the time for us to share the gospel. This is the time because people are in, they have COVID. They're, our government is, is imploding, and there's so many things going on right now. People are ripe. And many times, just give me a second here. Many times I think that they're not going to listen. But God opens their ears. Not us. And it's not easy. And you don't necessarily get to go up to someone and say, you're going to hell. But it's slowing down and listening to God's grace in the morning. And I'm, I'm preaching to myself on this one because I've done a terrible job with it lately. Um, and being Jesus' disciple just for that day. doesn't mean you're going to go out and go to Africa that day and minister to everybody, but there is a, a mission every day for us to share the gospel. It may not be verbal. It may be you reaching out to someone. 
Whoever God puts in your path, and I need to work on this. I need to be in tune with God's grace to do what that minister did for me, is to be a disciple. You know, that's a challenge for myself, you know, and for Christians, you know, in this time. So thank you for listening, and I'm going to close in prayer. Lord, we thank you uh, that we could meet today. We thank you for your grace, Lord, and I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who hasn't experienced your grace, who has not experienced your salvation, I pray that they would. And I pray as Christians, Lord, that you would just help us to be faithful to your call um, and to go forward and be your disciples, Lord. Just give us courage in these times and give us wisdom to navigate these difficult waters. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. If you did uh, decide to make a decision today to maybe follow Jesus, um, or maybe, you know, this is new to you, write it on your connection card um, that just here mentioned at the beginning of the service in the seat uh, back pocket in front of you. Uh, write down your prayer requests. We pray for you guys every week. And so communicate through us that way. If you want to get more involved and get deeper into um, you know, this life with God and this life with Jesus. We have groups, we have um, Bible studies, uh, so email office at Meeting House Church to find out how uh, we can connect you uh, better. But let's respond to God's goodness and his love uh, singing a little bit more this morning. jealous he is jealous for me he loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of this wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory I realize just how you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so
to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. So heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss in my heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Yeah, he Church, you guys are dismissed. Have a great week. We'll see you guys next Sunday.